Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. The other fascinating thing about the political dynamic, Kate, is Democrats seem to have found a way to get the kind of abortion policy they want, even if some of these state legislatures don't share their views on the issue. It seems to be to take it to the voters, that they think the voters are closer to the Democratic Party on abortion than the membership in some of these state legislatures. But the other piece of this is it seems to be becoming a strategy to juice turnout in some of these states. So there's an effort to have an abortion amendment on the New York ballot, on the Maryland ballot. These are not states where there is any sort of threat that a legislature is going to pass a restrictive abortion law. But they are states where there are Republicans in some of these House seats or state legislative seats that could be taken out if there is a tide of abortion-motivated voters who come to the polls in 2024. And there may be another one on Tuesday. This is a report in the Washington Post. There's a group called Arizona for Abortion Access that has filed paperwork for an abortion amendment in that state. And who knows if they will get the requisite signatures or meet whatever the requirements are to get on the ballot. But Kate, that's a swing state, and you could definitely see that changing the outcomes in some of these races up and down the ballot. Well, right. I mean, I think you have to know, Kyle, the grand irony that Justice Alito's decision to return this question to the states may, at least in the short term, be a political benefit to Democrats who spent the months and years before leading up to that decision warning of apocalypse, first of all, but also that abortion would basically be not available in many states, which has not panned out thus far. Though, Kyle, I'm stuck really on the lessons here for Republicans who are pro-life and do want to pass more pro-life bills through the legislatures and how they might succeed in getting other people to share their position. I really think an instructive episode on that front came up recently when pro-life groups were complaining about Ron DeSantis not supporting a 15-week federal ban on abortion. Now, Ron DeSantis signed a six-week abortion ban in Florida. If groups are hitting Ron DeSantis, they are very much aiming at the wrong target, someone who signed a six-week ban. So I think the underlying reason for that they said was, you know, that there should be a federal standard. And DeSantis was saying that he thinks that the pro-life movement has been most successful when it's been bottom up, which I think happens to be an accurate analysis. So I think the question now is how do advocates of uh, pro-life bills continue to make the moral case for their cause? while also accepting incremental progress and handling setbacks in a manner that continues to get more Americans to agree with them. What we're seeing now are several really big indicators that these early bans are not where voters are. You do see more political consensus closer to 15 weeks. That's what Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, for instance, has said he would support. But currently, the politics are really messy. And so I think there does need to be some reflection here about incremental gains, about not demanding perfect success immediately, and not chalking up a defeat to being outspent like progressives will continue to do, but maybe not making the case compelling enough to the public. I, I think those are good points. I will read the line again from Justice Alito's Dobbs decision. It says, we do not pretend to know how our political system or society will respond to today's decision overruling Roe and Casey. And even if we could foresee what will happen, we would have no authority to let that knowledge influence our decision. And so one of the the ironies Kate is hitting on here is that decision is what gave abortion policy back to the states, back to the people. That is what is responsible for these kinds of referendums that we are seeing in states like Ohio and Kansas and Michigan that in some cases go beyond the protections for abortion rights that Roe and Casey enshrined. On the point about the pro-life response to this, I think that's also a good one because I am seeing lots of chatter about how the side who was in favor of issue one was outspent and it was money that was coming from outside. But Kim, this is a 14-point loss for that side in a state, again, that President Trump won by eight points when President Trump was also losing the overall election. And so it does seem to me like there needs to be a recognition that the pro-life side has failed to convince 
a majority of the public in, in even some of these pretty conservative or purple states. Right. And not just for the reasons of this particular ballot initiative. I mean, let's be really clear. Why does the left love this particular strategy? Because it's not only delivering them the policy outcomes that they want, it's also ginning up the turnout that they want in elections. We saw that definitely in the last midterm. And, you know, you can see people like Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown super excited about the fact that abortion has now become a giant issue in the state. He's running for re-election next year. But he's now, now, I mean, by the way, let's just point out that a lot of these Democrats who were bemoaning and bewailing the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs are now celebrating all of that direct democracy that has put this issue back into the hands of the people. But Sherrod Brown and others are going to seize on this. They want it to not just for turnout, but it's an obvious way to deflect attention away from this president's very poor economic policies and the economic pain that people are feeling across the country. And so they want to talk about abortion. They want to talk about Donald Trump. And to the extent that the right's inability to hit on a policy and a strategy of dealing with this is enabling them to run the field with these messages, There's a lot at stake here beyond the question of abortion. It has to do with elections more broadly, other ballot questions that might be up, and people's focus as they go into the upcoming presidential season. The polling on abortion has always been conflicted because it has shown that people generally supported Roe v. Wade and opposed overturning Roe v. Wade, while at the same time saying that people wanted policies that Roe v. Wade made unconstitutional. And so if you go back and look at the Gallup numbers, here's the Gallup survey data posted at the about at the anniversary of the Dobbs decision. It says that Americans generally want abortion to be legal in the first three months of pregnancy, 69 percent to 24 percent. But then in the second three months of pregnancy, that flips 55 percent say they want it to be illegal. Only 37 percent say illegal. And that includes a majority of women, 52 percent oppose legal abortion in the second three months, again, according to this Gallup data. And so, Kate, that is the reality of the polling. And it is, I think, not really being pitched to by either side in this campaign. I think that doesn't reflect what this amendment in Ohio that's going to be on the ballot in November, I think, goes way beyond that. On the other hand, that's what Republicans should be pitching to as well. Yeah. And Kyle, since I was being tough on uh, the pro-lifers a little bit, I mean, now let me flip it and take the other side, which is that I think Democrats do try to present this as either you have no restrictions on abortion and it can be allowed all throughout pregnancy on an elective basis, or you have a very restrictive regime that allows no one to get it. And I think that is not accurate And I think to your point about the polling and how the consensus on abortion starts to break down later in the pregnancy, I mean, I think that makes sense. I mean, one thing that I think has contributed to that public view is the improvement in ultrasound technology and that most families have a 20-week ultrasound. And that has become much more vivid of what folks can see about unborn children. I think that's one reason you see that consensus. But I do think Democrats really do have an extreme view that they will have to moderate, too, if they want to prevail in the long term on this public debate. I mean, if you think about it, this is very still very new and has been out of the hands of American voters for decades because of Roe v. Wade. So this idea that Democrats can sustain their current position over time with just fear-mongering about any restrictions on abortion is, I don't think, tenable for them either. So I think There are, to your point, there are a large number of voters who are up for grabs, willing to be persuaded and want to hear substantive, reasonable arguments about the issue. But right now, we've seen that both sides, maybe because it's been out of the hands of voters for so long, both sides were firing blanks. They weren't really prepared to have a real debate on what a national consensus on this might look like. And it's really showing that it hasn't been a live issue. So I think it's early, but I think the Democrats are also in a precarious, untenable position over time with their extreme views on abortion. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch. 